Well, good morning. Hey. I enjoyed that for church, eh? That's the first time I've been to church for weeks, isn't it? Since February. So, <laughs> but uh, we were coming up here and uh, I took the liberty of saying to Neil, you loved your church so much, I'd like to come again. <laughs> so here we are. I loved your worship and I like the concept because I have a son with exactly the same concept. And it is, God inhabits the praises of his people. Well, he started a church in Melbourne uh, 17 years ago with 50 people. He has now 17,000. <laughs> and they come to the around the church and they're praising flat out just like you are. The musics aren't our style. They're not our music. They're, they're more the head-banging younger music. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, God inhabits the praises and people begin to get touched and, and the church is still going along, you know, despite all the shutdowns and everything, it's still going ahead. Now, for instance, I don't want to brag about my son, but it is an amazing story. He, he goes on to his online church because he's in Melbourne and everything's shut down. And uh, so he has a million people watching him online. <laughs> and then in June, every year they have first fruits offering in June. And the first fruits offering is for their outreach and various programs they want to get involved in. And this year, June, they're all shut down. Everybody shut down. They said, should we do it this time or should we leave it till we can get back to church? And so said, no, we'll do it as usual. So when he counted the offering, it was two million. <laughs> so the church is still going ahead. Despite the shutdowns, God's on the throne. Thank God for that. <laughs> and I'm so pleased you're having a go. Not every church will come out like this and, and be separated and have black gloves for the communion. <laughs> That's a new one on me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's lovely to be here, and uh, but the world doesn't know where they're going. They've got no answers. They're hoping to find a cure for this, uh, a vaccine for this, uh, um, <laughs> what do you call it? Code of yeah, and they're hoping to find a vaccine for that. That's the only hope. And in the meantime, they're all going broke. All around the world, they're going broke. Australia is paying so many people for not working. You ever heard of that? But it's to keep it from going broke, so everyone wouldn't go broke. And so Australia is piling up this massive debt, and uh, they're saying it'll take generations to pay it off. It's going to be so much. So the world is in total confusion, and they haven't got the answers. We have. We have. If they don't listen to us. But, but we don't need them anyhow. We've got enough to, to see it happen. And this is the answer. It was given to Solomon at the height of his power 3,000 years ago. It was the height of his power. The temple was built. It was incredibly rich. And they were the most powerful nation in the planet at that time. And God came to him and says, there's going to be down times too. Like there'll be, there'll be times where um, there'll be famine. And there'll be times there'll be no rain. And there'll be times when the pestilence, locusts come and eat all the crops up. He said, that's going to happen too. So he's telling him all these good times you're in now, it won't always last forever. There will be down times. But he said, the key is, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways. I will hear their prayer and heal their land. That was his promise. That is the answer today, and I can prove it to you. Um, last year, as the elections rolled on, and they were getting close. Everyone had written Scott Morrison off. He's the first Pentecostal Prime Minister 
in Australia. What a miracle. The despised Pentecostals. We finally get one who's a prime minister of the country. Can you imagine? But they say, oh, it's short-lived. He'll be, he'll be out the next election. It's in the bag for Shorten. And all the media, everybody said it was all over for, for, for Scott and that he was just being a short-time prime minister and then it was all over. But a 77-year-old lady was woken up at 3 in the morning and God said to her, if you get the church to start praying, I've given you a Christian prime minister, now stir the church up to start praying and he'll win. Her name was Margaret Court. <laughs> And she stirred the church up to start praying. And I've been around for a few years and I haven't seen the church united in prayer like this for over 60 years. But 60 years ago, just to remind everybody, <laughs> Billy Graham came to Australia. And when Billy Graham came, he said that he wanted his team. They went around all around our country for two years setting up prayer groups all over the place. And they began to pray. And the Australian church began to pray for Billy Graham and we saw a move of God like we've never seen in Australia. I was a student in Bible school at the time in Brisbane and I went to hear him at the, at the entertainment centre. There was 80,000 people gathered to hear the gospel. And I was start, I'd started a little Sunday school. I was in, as a student, I started Sunday school at Inala. And Inala was, everyone said, oh, you know, Inala's. <laughs> there those. Uh, anyhow, when uh, Billy was sent, we said to the kids, get your parents and we'll give them a free bus ride in to hear Billy Graham. We packed the bus. 20 people got saved in that bus. That's how we started the Inala Church, which is still going today. And it was the greatest move in Australia. When you think at Melbourne, I got some stats here. I better read them out to back up my comments uh, about what happened at that time. Let's see, he said over 3 million, nearly a third of Australian population that time attended in person. Can you imagine that? In Brisbane, there's 80,000, and there were 246 decisions overall. Uh, in MCG, they had the biggest crowd of all. They had the record crowd of Australia. Never beaten, 143,000 people packed into the MCG, and they've never, for grand finals, whatever, cricket, footy, They've never got anywhere near that figure. It was the greatest crowd. And in Sydney, they had to use two auditoriums and they had 150,000 to care for the people. And we prayed and prayed. And then what we did, we got slack. And we gradually slackened off our prayer just as Jesus knew we would. That's why he gave that parable. He says, you ought always to pray and not to give up in Luke 18, and he talks to them how to do it, to keep praying, and how to be motivated to keep praying. But we slacked out, we slacked down, and gradually sacked down. And by, by the time we got to the 21st century and to the 18th uh, year or the 17th year of the 21st century, we were legislating for sin. And God doesn't like that when we go down those roads. And so things began to go belly up, didn't they? And so we had all these difficulties. And Margaret Court got praying, and through her prayer, this is a picture of the miracle of her prayer. But it's Scott Morrison on the day he was elected. And there were two miracles, one that he was there, and the other was that I was there. And... This is how it all happened. I hadn't planned to be there. He didn't think he'd be there. No one thought he'd be there, but there he was. And this is what happened. 
The church that he goes to in Sydney is a church started by someone, I'm sure Norm would, uh, you'd, Neil would know this person, old Norm Armstrong. He, he went to all the churches and preached in all the churches. He, wonderful old Pentecostal, old Norm. And uh, he'd started a church in Sydney 70 years ago. And that's the church where Scott Morrison attends now. <laughs> so they were having their 70th anniversary and it so happened to be on the same day the election results were finalised. It hadn't been planned that way, but that's how it went. And so Scott, uh, I was watching the TV. I wasn't supposed to be there. They had a guest speaker. There it is. There's proof. Proof of a miracle. <laughs> There's Scott in the middle, his wife and me. And uh, I wasn't supposed to be there. They had a big shot preacher. And Scott wasn't be, supposed to be there, according to all the media. But the church had prayed. Margaret Court had said, if my people, God woke me up at three in the morning, get praying and God will get him back in. And he went against everything else that people said, but he got in. Anyhow, I, well, how I got there was that the guest speaker got crooked the day before. <laughs> And I had history with that church, actually. I was down through the years. I had a girlfriend for about three weeks from that church <laughs> in 1959. <laughs> I actually pastored it for one month when they asked me to come and look after it while the pastor went on, on a trip somewhere. So I knew a bit about that. So when the guest speaker got crooked, they yelled out to me to come down. So I came down. And I'm watching the TV, wondering whether what's happening with the elections. And about midnight, he rings. He wins. And Dell says to me, she was, she, she was back in, in the Gold Coast. She was faithful to her commitment. She, she, she had a commitment, so she couldn't come. So, but she said, Scott said, rain, hail or shine, I'm going to church. So I thought, oh, wow, well, we Prime Minister just elected on. I'm the guest speaker. So I, I, in the way, they picked me up in the morning. I said to the driver, is Scott coming? They said, we don't know. So we drive down towards the church as we got near it. Cop cars everywhere. <laughs> Media everywhere. But oh, he's here. He's here. So uh, he, he dealt with them all outside. And he says, he asked me any questions outside. But when I go in church, I don't want you to come in there. And interrupt. That's time when I thank worship and thank God. So I was sitting. It's a circular kind of arrangement. I was sitting on on that position. I could see them come. He come in. He came in the door, sat down, and the church is singing. We exalt thee. Well, it's got hands raised. He's full of the glory of God, praising God. You know. And then the next song was, uh, we. Uh, God is so good, so he's going on once again, really old-time Pentecostal, the way he was carrying on. And then they, uh, the pastor got him up on stage, so he thanked the people, and he knelt on the platform, and the elders gathered around him, laid hands on him, and uh, he got up and he just said a couple of words. He said, it's not that hard, you know. He said, it's all about faithfulness and obedience. And I listened to that and I thought, he's pinched my sermon. So I got up and I said, uh, I said, he's just pinched my sermon. I preached about Gideon. And, <laughs> and exactly his strengths and weaknesses, why he, I said he was a nothing. Gideon was a nothing. But he had two things, faithfulness <laughs> and obedience. So that's how good God is. See, so he does answer prayer. If my people are called by my name, he will answer. And I believe our challenge now is to keep praying for revival for Australia. And I'm so pleased you have those kind of Holy Ghost old-time prayer meetings. And uh, we were, I taught our church to walk. We're the walking prayers. And we walk up and down. I warned them, I said, when you come near the wall there, open your eyes and turn, because I don't want you to go crashing into the wall. <laughs> but every church has, but I'm so pleased you do it. And so uh, get praying for this revival. I believe the nation 
is our chance for the nation to turn to God under this crisis because they don't know where else to go. Unless they find a vaccine of something, they don't know what to do. They, they, they're going to run out of money sooner or later. They can't keep pouring money in and pouring it in. It's all got to be paid back. Someone's got the money somewhere. So we need the church to pray. And if we do, we will see revival like we saw in Billy Graham. There's no reason why we can't see something like that even greater than that if we pray. And that is the key. If my people are called by name, it hasn't changed. The plan hasn't changed. God said it and he gave it. And down through the years, if you follow revival history, it's only through prayer. As people pray, it starts to happen. It doesn't happen with black walls or flash music. <laughs> they might be okay. They can be happening. But unless they pray on top of that, it won't happen. And so let me encourage you to pray. Now, in Luke chapter 1, Jesus understood this, and he, he gives them a, a clue how to do it. And uh, he says to them, when the sun comes, verse 8, very interesting verse, when the sun comes back, will there be faith on the earth? And he's talking about the end time. When I come back, what will the world be like? And as you look in the scriptures, you find that there are two streams. There's one stream that talks about the falling away and the church going backwards. Matthew deals with that quite a bit in Matthew 24. He says, uh, they shall fall away and, uh, you know, the church will uh, go after other false religions and all those things that Matthew 24 deals with. And it looks pretty bad for the church. You know, things are going to go very bad. And then it, it says the same in Thessalonians. I've got the scriptures here, but... I'm, I'm sort of walking away from my notes, so I better go back to them and quote you the scriptures. But um, he says there in in Matthew in Luke 18. Well, oh, where's my notes? Here. Got to have a few notes, you know, to keep the fire going. Matthew 18 says, "Because iniquity shall abound." 24:12, the love of many shall grow cold. That's not very positive, is it? Matthew 24, 22, Except those days should be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. And then in Thessalonians says, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, but that day will come, will not come, except there be a falling away first, and the man, the son of tradition, be revealed. 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times uh, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 2 Timothy 3 says, For this also know that in the last days perilous times shall come. And then it goes on, verse 5, Having a form of God in this, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So there is a stream of scriptures that talk about the last days being a great falling away. But that's not the only thing the scripture says. It says there's also going to be a mighty Holy Ghost revival in the last days. And uh, largely prophesied by Joel, but it's interesting when Joel says in the last days, this is... Amazing when you think about it, what he was saying. He says, it shall come to pass afterward, Joel says. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now in those days, one person about 100 years would say that they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But he said, Joel says, it come to pass afterward, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy and so on and so on. We all know the scriptures powerfully. Peter quotes it on the day of Pentecost when he's uh, speaking and challenging them. And he, changed, he takes that scripture. This is that which is said by Joel the prophet. 
but he changes one word. It shall come to pass in the last days, Peter says, saith God, I pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And so there's no reason to believe the lies that we're told that there's just for the first century church and that was it. And after that, we didn't need it anymore. It's for everyone. And if the church prays, it will happen. And when it starts happening, it's phenomenal. You just can't hold it back. And God's got his ways. If we really pray, unusual ways of starting a revival. Now, I, I spent seven years of my life in New Guinea as a missionary there, and I saw revival break out. And uh, it, it's a fascinating story. But that nation now is, is massively moved towards God through the revival that swept through that country. But when I got there, just before I got there, in 1962 I, was, I got there, um, they're just beginning a, a bit of a move. But what had happened, they'd been there since, they'd been there 70 years. They went there in 1948 and started a little mission up there in Marbrook area. And after 10 years, they had 30 people. That was it, 30 people. No one filled with the Spirit. No one baptized in the Holy Ghost. Just 30 people. And they're a bit scared about the Holy Ghost. Oh, we don't the Spirit, you know, get the wrong Spirit. And they're a bit nervous, the missionaries, about it. So they had about eight centers, but 30 believers. So my dad went up there, who's got a gift of laying on of hands for the baptism of the Spirit. And he said to the missionaries, Send me your leaders. So they sent five leaders. And he talked to them about the baptism of the Spirit. Out of those five, four of them instantly spoke in tongues. And they spoke of their experience. They said it was like a volcano. And they had amazing experiences. One guy had a strange manifestation that just didn't, it seemed a bit odd. My dad said, you know, okay, mate, just, just sit there and go back to your village and try. We'll pray again later on. So this bloke goes back to his village. He's supposed to be one of the Christian leaders, but he was a deceiver. And he's laying in his bed and he can't sleep. And three in the morning, he gets up and he's screaming at the top of his voice, the Holy Spirit is chasing me, he says. Runs through the village. He says, I'm an evil man. The Holy Spirit is chasing me. And next minute they find him at the end of his hut his head had gone through the wall and he's, and he's crying and telling about all the sins he's doing and all the Marys he's got as his wives on the side and that he's doing that he's a deceiver and a crook. So that story, <laughs> God's, God always does it dramatic to me. <laughs> that story just went all around the mountains, the villages everywhere. Next Sunday the church is jammed back and it started a revival. And we're only part of it. Uh, there's a many, the COC and other groups have done a great job up in New Guinea. CRC. But just, just the AOG movement alone has 20% of the population belong to the AOG. <laughs> and uh, believers, in, as we are, speak in tongues and so on. They've just had that amazing move of God. They have something like 600,000 believers. They have uh, about 3,500 churches. That's what happens in, in, that in that 70 years. From a nation that had nothing in 70 years, and then there's other movements, they've all got great churches going and so on. So God can do it, but we've got to pray. And God says there are two these two channels. That's why he asks the question in Luke chapter eight, 18, verse 8. When the sun comes back, and he puts a question mark. Will he find faith on the earth? Question mark. And it was given after that parable on prayer. And what he's saying, get praying like that widow woman. That widow woman in the parable, if you remember, she had nothing. She went to the judge who didn't care about God or man. He was interested in the bribe. She goes to him, he knocks her back, and he kept knocking her back, but she kept going and going and going. And then he finally he says, 
even though I don't care about God or man yet because this woman weary me, I will hear her request. So let's weary God with a revival for Australia and let's call upon him. And when you feel like giving up, remember that widow woman because your praying will make a difference. Now it says, this may motivate you to move a bit too. It says in that chapter, uh, it says, when the son comes back, will he find faith? Well, how close are we to Jesus coming? How close are we? You know, they've been predicting his coming all the time for years and years. And say, oh, yeah, 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 we've heard that. You know, and Peter said, spoke about that, and he says, you know, you're saying this. But there are a few clues in Scripture. Now, this is one. Matthew 24, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world as a witness, and then the end shall come. So that's pretty definite. When the whole world is heard, then the end shall come. So in 1988, I went to America and met with one of the missionary statesmen there, and they said, we're going to find out how many places are left without a gospel message. So he organized all his missionaries and they began to do stats and gather facts. And they said, this, they said the world, when it says this gospel of the king shall preach to all the world, the concept is all ethnic group. That's the concept in the Greek there for the world, ethnic groups. So he said, let's see if we can count the ethnic groups in the world in 1988 that haven't got a functioning church. And by an ethnic group, this will this help you to understand what he means by that. Take Pakistan, for instance. If you go to Pakistan, you have Muslims, the dominant religion. You have Hindus, quite large. You have Christians, reasonably strong, but not that strong. But then you have another group who worship spirits. They're animists. And they keep to themselves, and there's 4,000 of them. They're an unreached people's group. And so they began to study the whole world's maps and scenes. And I got a booklet given them by the organization of 18,000 unreached people's groups without functioning church. They had the map, the language, where they were, and a page on each. And this was sent around to all the churches, particularly in, in America and others. And they asked churches to do this. It says, Jesus can't come back because there's 18,000 ethnic groups not reached yet. So will you look for one of those and adopt one of those groups in prayer? Just anywhere where you feel, adopt a particular ethnic group according to this book where the, where the need was. And as you pray, then send teams over to visit that area and give out tracts. And then as you get converts, start a little home group. And then eventually start a church. So they uh, started that in 1988. And they used to say, Jesus, go and come. Because his word says this gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all the world and there's still 18,000 without the gospel, ethnic groups. So the church has got hold of that, particularly in, in Brazil and particularly in America. The evangelical Christians got hold of it. In America there's, there's at least 52 million evangelicals and they all took a group each and Mr. Google keeps a record of it. And if you're into Googling, do it when you get home. Don't do it now, please. But they've got a section there called Unreached People's Groups. And this missionary organization has been feeding Google as they get more groups, more groups, more groups, more groups. And the last time I looked, there was 200 groups left. Only 200 left. They could reach that by Christmas easily. I don't say Jesus is coming by Christmas, but we are getting close to the end. 
And because of that, we have to pray. And I believe that was Jesus giving that motivation. When the sun comes back, will he find faith on the earth? Well, I say yes if we pray. If, my, if we'll pray like that widow woman, keep knocking day by day by day, God, come and send revival, send revival, send revival. Give us a move of God, send revival. Turn the nation back to God. You did it for Scott. That was a miracle. Now that's just the beginning of the miracles. Give it a, a further and, and keep on hammering away and praying. And let's look back and enjoy the, <laughs> the fruit of it. Amen. So we give him praise this morning that he's going to mightily move. Let's, let's all stand and, and have a real old-time Pentecostal call on the God to move by his, by his power. Amen. Glory to God. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we believe we're coming near to the end of time. We ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, send a revival, send a revival, send a mighty Holy Ghost revival to this nation. Stir it up, Father. Give us a mighty move of your Spirit, a mighty move of your Spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, we give you praise. Amen. Do that every day. Do, I have prayer with Dell. Every day we pray for revival for Australia. And your church, as often as you can gather, do it and just let's believe and let's see what God can do. Thank amen, you. Amen, 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 amen. Oh, let the revival fire burn. Let the fire burn. We need the fire of God. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. How old are you now, young fella? 85. 85, my goodness gracious. I wobble a bit when I walk. You wobble a bit. <laughs> That's a speed wobble. <laughs> oh, amen. Father, we want to worship you. Look, I, was, I really believe that this morning that people are going to get healed and delivered and set free if you haven't already been done uh, healed. If you felt God speaking to you this morning about your body while you're taking communion, and perhaps you'd like us to just pray with you. I'm going to get a brother to come out as well and, and just agree with us together. Just come out the front here and let the Spirit of God touch you. And uh, we're going to sing a, a song. Amen. It's been a joy to have you here, sir. It's been a joy to have you here. It's been a blessing to just hear your heart and, and really Tuesday night I really encourage people to come to pray. And uh, believe God. It's faithful people are coming every Tuesday night, but we need more to come and pray. Something about people coming to pray. Sometimes it's a little bit cold, but that doesn't matter. If you can't come, get a, get a, as I said last week, gather some people up and bring them out and pray with them. Let's find some during the day. But we're just going to sing that song and we're going to ask Andrew to come out the front. But we're going to pray with you this morning. If you just believe a little bit more touch a little bit more to help you through that if you believe God's touched you this morning and want to meet with him to get healed and delivered this morning